sometimes in your working life you meet someone and they make such a huge impact on you and and they then become part of your life in general and when that happens you know it's a pretty special thing i want to dedicate today's podcast to a friend of mine who passed away recently his name was sean broderick and the likes of him we will never ever meet again sean taught me so much Oh, he he taught me so much about retail, first of all, because that's where I met him. But he just taught me about how to be a better person just by watching him. He always put others first. He enjoyed every day of his life, his passion for life, his unassuming ways. I will never, ever forget. And I want anyone in retail who's listening to know that Sean loved the rag trade, just like all of you. He loved the buzz of getting to know people of helping people and building community. What a community he built. He made it look so, so easy. It's just the type of person he was. He was a true gentleman and a great friend. Rest in peace, Sean. Our guest today on the Dig Podcast is Glyn Roberts, Chief Executive of Retail A&I. So Retail A&I is Northern Ireland's only locally based retail and wholesale business organisation which provides professional advice and gives a voice to the independent sector at the Northern Ireland Assembly and Westminster. Glynn is very passionate about helping retailers and keeping the high street alive, as am I. So I couldn't wait to get him in the hot seat today to talk all things retail and the high street. So that was in my words, but do you want to tell everybody just what you do and what Retail NI stands for? Well, thanks, Karen. It's really, it's really good to be here. Um, Retail NI represents about 2,000 independent retailers, wholesalers, and suppliers to our sector, where, as Caroline said, we're very passionate about the future of our high street, standing up for independent retailers. And we're also doing more to support local suppliers, new producers with their route to market as well. So we're helping lots of new food companies, gin makers. Um, who are probably too small to get listed uh, with the big supermarkets. We're helping them with their route to market as well. Maybe we want to dip their toe in the water in half a dozen stores. So we're actively working right across the supply chain to support local, to support our indigenous business base. And uh, I've always said, and I think this has been reinforced by the pandemic, where we all appreciated the role of independent retailers in our local communities. And, And let's not forget in lockdown one where we had uh, retail staff that were there in our convenience stores, in our supermarkets, in our butchers, in our off licenses, thank God. Um, ah, you yes, know, thank God. You know, all, all putting their own health at risk to make sure we all had food and other essential products. But I, I think the role of independent retailers, particularly in many smaller towns where they were supporting older and vulnerable people, is something that uh, I think, you know, they are unsung heroes. And I think as we emerge from the pandemic, I think we have a new appreciation for the important role of independent retailers, not just in terms of our economy and supporting jobs, but in our community and very much the the businesses that I have the pleasure to represent are all about the community, um, their hearts in the community. uh, And that's really why independent independent retail, rather than being the, the past of our retail sector, will be the future. They'll be the change makers, the thought leaders of the 21st century high street. And you know what really grits me, Glenn, is when I hear people say, oh, the high street's dead and nobody will be going back into the town. At my toes, Colonel, because i that's not the way it's going to be. Sure, it's not. Please nope. give us a bit of confidence here. I, listen, I, I, absolutely. I think you know, we've got to ask ourselves, what does success look like for 21st century high streets? And I think it's very simple. It's about creating fun, family-friendly destinations where people want to come back time and time again. That's how we get people away from the Amazons and all those online retailers. We create a fun experience, a fun family friendly experience by putting the social into shopping. And it's about seeing our high streets as more than just shops, but seeing them as hubs, as ecosystems for lots of different types of business. And that's where independent retail is so important in that mix. There isn't much fun pushing a trolley around some big box out of town, but surely there is something fun if you have a, a town centre or high street, which is a dynamic mix of retail, of hospitality, of all of those things. And where my office is in Ballyhackham, or we even have a yoga quarter now opposite my office. And you can see, you know, uh, all the different people doing yoga classes. 
um, with their mats under the arm in the local shops and the local restaurants. You know, and that shows, you know, we need to be creative. We need to evolve our thinking about what the high street was in the past. But I do believe, I'm much more encouraged now, I think in the medium to long term, there are huge opportunities. We do have a challenge at the minute because we're not just facing a cost of living crisis, we're facing a cost of doing business crisis as well. So we have a perfect storm. Many of our members are facing a perfect storm of issues uh, around obviously the huge increases in energy bills, national insurance. And for many of them, next month's gonna be a particular pinch point because many of them will start to pay rates again after two and a bit years with the COVID relief ending. And that's, I'm really worried about that. And of course, on the consumer side, you have uh, people paying more for their mortgages in some cases. You're seeing obviously inflation, and I think a real push and squeeze on consumer confidence. And that, that, that's far in. But I do think in the medium to long term, uh, it will get better. Uh, and I think that's what we need to aim at. So let's talk about the executive. I know you can't do anything about it, but we need things to happen there for the retail to get support, isn't that right? Yeah. Any inside info? Well, um, like what's happening uh, down there? <laughs> I, I, I wish, um, but I think there's one thing is that we're not short of policies, we're not short of ideas, we're not short of strategy. What we are short of is delivery. Um, I was one of the chairs of the Northern Executive led High Street Task Force that was set up, and we produced a 14 point plan, which includes a five year reconstruction plan for our high streets. Um, that is all ready to go. It's a novel and ready plan, which would mean that we fix things like business rates, planning, regeneration, transport, all of those things, we improve and modernize them. So that's all ready to go. And you know, we've produced our own new ambition plan, which is 29 ideas about how we can get the high street moving again. So there's any, a lot- Just uh, to jump in, any, could you give us one or two or is that top of your chapter, Well, the, that the, the biggest issue um, is business rates. Our system of business rates is broken, it's antiquated. Uh, it's not fit for purpose, so it needs to be based on fairness and the ability to afford and needs to be equitable. But you know, we've also put forward a number of ideas of how we can turn our rate system from a disabler into an enabler. So we put forward the idea, if you're an independent retailer, you're expanding your store, you're bringing on more staff, that you should be able to write off, say, four or five months of rates to incentivize you to do that. Similarly, if you want to invest in green technology, uh, you would be able to get rates relief for that as well. So we, we've put forward lots of ideas. And we're also now, and we just got this in before the, the executive fell. So if you are to open a new store now, um, you will only pay 50% rates for your first two years. Now, that was our idea, our initiative that we put forward. So that means your vital first year costs, um, you know, rates hopefully will not be as big as an issue as it would. So, you know, that gets you out of your vital first year trading into your second year and hopefully onwards and upwards. So I suppose there's a lot of businesses listening that are perhaps toying with the idea of a premises and then that holds them back, the fear of the overheads. And I know I've been there, like rent and rates crippled me when I had my shop. But the fact that that might be coming into play would be so good. So we're looking at that when the executive get back up and running and this all can be implemented. Is that right with your ambition plan? Well, listen, uh, we, we can't but try. No we, we can't but try. But, you know, I think, you know, people have talked about the, the challenge of digital. And it's one thing that I would say is, is that, um, you know, we were able to lobby successfully for grants to help independent retailers raise their game uh, digital-wise or dig increase their digital footprint because obviously many of them during the pandemic had to suddenly learn how to do click and collect and they had no clue how to do that. Um, so we got those grants over the line. We also got a suite of courses where there's six FE colleges to help build and develop their digital literacy skills. So I, I would say that sometimes crises are the best time for innovation. And I think that's going to be one of the few good things to come out of the pandemic was that I think we have much more tech savvy, digital aware, independent retail sector than we have ever had before because not every independent retailer can sell online, but you know what, they can market online, they can really be proficient at Insta and all those different other uh, social media. But you know, I'm saying much more tech savvy, but you know what, they want to keep the store that they have they want to get that bricks and clicks partnership right. They want to do something which keeps their, you know, keeps their presence on the high street, but also they don't, you know, they don't dig their or put their head in the sand and ignore the huge uh, strides we've seen with digital.
It means so much to me to have a partner for the podcast which has the same values and mission as me. And that's definitely the case for our partner, Evolve. I want you to listen to their mission and how they can help you grow as an entrepreneur. Evolve is a community for female entrepreneurs and leaders across the island of Ireland that has been created and funded by Taris's Enterprises, who believe passionately in business for good. Evolve's mission is to enable you to step into your power and realize your full potential by inspiring you, educating, connecting, and as part of the Evolve community, you will be part of the movement to lift women up and achieve true equality of opportunity. The Evolve Academy will provide a series of face-to-face masterclasses and mentoring. The Evolve Trailblazers and Founders series tell the stories of inspiring women who are paving the way. And the Evolve Library is your first stop online hub, providing a packed resource library to progress your entrepreneurial or leadership journey. Join our community today on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter and at evolvewomen.org. Applications are now open for the very first intake of the Evolve Academy. Take the opportunity today to realise your full potential. Evolve, empowering women to be women of power. Yeah, for sure. We'll be talk- I know you've just come in there now with us, kind of our topics all day as we digital and drive it. But the brick, because for me, I had a bricks and mortar, that passion for once you've had that bricks and mortar store in the high street. And, you know, is there anything that businesses can be doing now then in this time that we're in to survive until these plans all come into place? Well, I think like anywhere you need a government to do things. So, um, you know, we want this rates holiday that is due to end uh, next month extended out to January because I think that would take the edge off some of the, the huge perfect storm of costs that many uh, re- independent retailers have. And of course, you know, we still have all the aftershocks from the, the, the pandemic. And it was particularly hard because, you know, many of our fashion retailers that we have, uh, you know, only a year ago or a year a bit ago, couldn't even do click and collect, but they, they'd see the big supermarkets selling as much clothes and books and toys. Yet if you're an independent retailer selling those products, you couldn't open. So that had a severe uh, impact on many of those traders. And that's why it was good to see that they, when we looked at the spend local card, that many of those retailers that were forced to close um, during the pandemic actually got the land share of that spend. So that's good. So when we looked at the figures, the spend local card had something like 75% spent with independent retailers. And do you know what? That, that, that's what we set out to do with it. Um, there's this narrative where this spend local card was wasted. It was spent on Amazon vouchers. It wasn't. 75% of it was spent local independent retailers. That money was recycled around the rest of the economy. We're 70p in every pound you spend with an independent retailer is recycled around the rest of the economy. And that message was heard loud and clear by consumers. Uh, So I very much see a much stronger determined independent retail sector who has been through so much, whether it's the Brexit, whether it's been the pandemic, uh, all of those things that there's now determination really to make a difference. And if you see big cities like Belfast, Belfast City Centre, they're desperate to get more independent retailers into the city centre to offer something different and diverse. Yeah, we need, we need, definitely need the, when I walk around Belfast sometimes I'm like, oh, it lacks that spirit of independent retailers. So that would be amazing if that happened with the reduced rates and all of that that's going to make that possible. So you talked about the experience and we talked about the experience all morning and all the different talks. So retailers now, I suppose, could come together to create that family experience. They should be doing that anyway, right? To attract people in. So I guess if people are listening, that's what you could be doing right now, is working together. And I was part of the traders group in Dungannon, and I think that that's key as well, isn't it? To come together as traders and then seek out help from the likes of Retail a and for any kind of strategy that you're going to build. So do you want to talk about Retail a and a bit and how you can help any retailers that are in the audience? Well, well firstly, we're, we're the only organisation, local organisation with a full-time office that's there promoting independent retailers of all uh, types and sizes and sectors. So we're, we're very passionate about that. Uh, one big initiative we're bringing forward is we do, our awards are very different than any other business group. Our High Street Heroes, which we're launching on Monday, is an online public vote for the best independent retailer. Um, so there's no judges. 
the judges or the shoppers, um, and they decide who's the best fashion retailer, best convenience, the best butcher, the best deli, all the rest of it. And we did it last year, uh, admittedly under restrictions. We had over 8,000 people voting. But what was coming through loud and clear is maybe very small independent retailers uh, in uh, small towns who would never think of entering those big business awards were getting voted upon and they were winning. And it was really good to get that recognition to those traders. So, you know, we had a fantastic uh, uh, deli in Ardenley Avenue called Two Sisters in, in Belfast, run by Victoria and her two daughters. Um, you know, Victoria just came out of nowhere and she pulled really, really well and won the best deli. Um, up against very stiff competition, you know, from Sawyer's and Arcadia and all the delis that we know well. Um, and that showed that, you know, a really good retail entrepreneur that really had sort of grasped the importance of, of keeping their feet in the ground, keeping their, their connections with the community, but above all else, offering something different. So those awards are opening on Monday? Yes, so believe it, we're launching at Stormont. Um, uh, we get, but I think it's important that we, we do that because you know, part of the message we're is saying is like we need you guys back. Um, you know, it's important if we're going to affect real change, if we're going to get that 21st century high streets delivered, then you know we need a, a government in place. But really, what we are trying to do with our high street awards um, is reward and highlight uh, and showcase those amazing independent retailers who do so much, who get very little reward. But our awards are all about highlighting, celebrating. Um, what their, their contribution is, not just to the economy, uh, not just to our high streets, but to our community as well. So the people in the audience can vote for their, the person they hold high in those different sectors? Yes, so I mean, you can nominate whoever you want, as long as they're an independent retailer. Um, we will be going live on 4th of July, so we rebrand 4th of July as Independence Day. Um, so you'll be able to vote throughout the month of July. If your favorite independent retailer, we're working uh, with Belfast uh, Live as our, as our media partner. So, um, and you know, we also do the best high street. Um, so it was really good last year. Omer Road won the year last year. The year before that was Newton Ards, and the year before that was Ballycastle. So we're getting a really good geographical spread. Um, and it's really good to see that, you know, you had Omer Road, all the traders had posters out saying vote for us. So it was great. So, you know, on, on 4th of July, vote independent. Definitely. So think about that independent retailer that needs that lift and go and, and, and log as a brief. So where can people find out more about the awards, um, Glenn? Um, they will be uh, going out. If you go to our website, retailandi.com, we will be shortly launching next week uh, where you can vote. You can't vote until 4th of July. It's going to be a big marketing campaign. So we're, I think we've got something like 30 billboards. We're in 65 T-squares and the buses. You, know, you hopefully will not ignore it. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's more than just a vote uh, and, a, and, a, and a, a, I suppose a, an award. It's a, I suppose in many ways, it's a call to action um, for the community to celebrate, support um, what those independent retailers. And I've said that 70p in every pound that you spend with an independent retailer is recycled back into the economy. So you're supporting local producers, local farmers um, and local innovation as well. Amazing. So Retail and I so we're going to find out all the information about how Retail and I can help you as a business and also how you can support another business by voting for them. So someone on your high street, someone that works damn hard. So thank you so much, um, Glenn, for being on the Dick Podcast today. Um, it's a pleasure to have you here and everyone can connect through the website or your social media on Instagram as well at Facebook, Retail and I. So big um, round of applause for Glenn, please. Thank you so much. So we are now going to speak to Derek Wright and I really wanted to have him on today's podcast because he knows all things retail and high street. Derek is the president of Newton Arts Chamber of Trade. He is the founder of The Precinct and he's so passionate about the high street and I know this firsthand because I worked with Derek on a few projects a few years ago. He is also a previous winner of High Street Heroes and he knows exactly what it takes to attract people onto the high street. I can't wait for you to hear from him.
Derek is the founder of The Precinct, which is home to 18 startup businesses in Newton Arts. There might be more added actually uh, since the last time I was talking to him, but we'll find out more shortly. Um, it was named Business of the Year in 2019 and has scooped lots of awards since it's been established. Derek is also the president of Newton Arts Chamber of Trade and the owner of Street Life for the past, wait for it, 38 years. That's a long flipping time so we need to hear all about how that happens and how, how you're still there after 38 years and thriving and um, Derek is not afraid to talk about the challenges in business and he's very open about his own journey in fact he recently did a post on social and that's what actually jogged my memory about Derek's journey and why I reached out to him for the podcast because this is what he said now this is hard hitting 11 years ago today I was a failure 10th of June 2011, I made 142 people redundant, including myself, when I closed all our stores and shopping centres. Failing was painful, embarrassing and life-changing. Thankfully, I'm surrounded by a great team of family, friends, work colleagues and customers that motivated me to start again. I'm proud of what we've achieved since then and I'm extremely thankful for all your continued support. So when I read that, I was like, oh my God, that hit me hard because of my own journey in retail and everything that I've been through as well. And um, so I was like, God, I must get in touch with Derek and see when he come on the podcast. So thank you so much, Derek, for coming on the Dig podcast today. Thank you. Good, good to meet up again. Yes, no, absolutely. And Derek and I have, well, I suppose we'll talk about that as the podcast goes on, but we met each other a few years ago um, on the social media journey. I've said in touch since, recently connected at an event, and now here he is. I roped him in to the Dick podcast. So Derek, look, the podcast is all about business and actionable learning. That's what I really want people when they're listening to say, right, I'm inspired to do this, or, you know, I've listened to that and now I'm going to change what I do, or I'm going to embrace that new way. So I knew you were the man, but look, it hasn't been easy. And I, I give a wee Snapchat there, but do you want to give us a wee bit of background or what's been going on, how you've kind of got to where you are? Where did it all start? Where did it all start? Well, it all, it all started basically when I was six months old. Uh, my parents started a business. Uh, basically, my mum started a clothes clothing store in Newton Arts called Dresswell. And uh, she had it going for a couple of years. And then uh, once, once that, was, that, was, that was started in 1965, so uh, the year I was born. So basically, um, my dad still kept his, his full-time job to, to keep a, a proper wage coming in, into the house, household. And uh, then my dad joined, joined the business within a couple of years and basically grew, grew the business. Um, through the difficult times in Northern Ireland, through the, the late sixties and the seventies, and uh, yeah, and I was very much part of it. Um, I was always every every dinner table, every tea table was a board meeting, um, and basically we discussed it. Um, and uh, one of my mum always reminds me of basically when I was nine years of age, I was in P six in the local primary school, and. Uh, I had come home that night and uh, had had told my dad that uh, I, I thought he should buy that shop. And uh, he said, what do you mean you should buy that shop? And I said, well, I was coming home from school and I called into the shop called JT Hills, the one you were talking about last night buying. And the staff at the time had said they'd watched this young boy in his, in his shorts walking around, walking around, looking up at the ceiling, looking around the shop. Uh, it was a two-story shop. And uh, basically I was doing my... Uh, a bit for the family to check it out, and, uh, and he was shocked that at the dinner table I'd said, "Yeah, we should buy that." So, so maybe that's why when when there was ten years of age, they shipped me off to a boarding school, um, <laughs> and uh, to, to to the get out of the way so they could run the business properly. So, and then and then so you went off to school, and then what age did you join the actual trade, like the shop? Well, basically through school, I was boarding school. So basically, I, I I started my business life at school. Um, I ran tuck shops. I I ran different enterprises, I ran groups, hobbies, whatever I could to turn money. Um, I, I was not academic at all, um, but I was always a people person and, and I, I enjoyed interactions with people. Um, school books were not my forte. And that's so good to hear because some people believe like you have to have the business degree and you have to have all the qualifications to be a business person and inverted commas, absolutely not. Yeah, well, I came back. I, I, le I left uh, Coleraine in um, 1982, I think it was, and uh, I came back and went to the local college 
uh, and done business studies at the local college. My dad was was keen that I got some sort of background uh, and a business background, so I had to do the old principle of accounts and, and all that going back in the day. There was there was no uh, computers or spreadsheets as such really really then, so it was all the hard ledgers and manuals. But I was keen to to be on the shop floor. I, I wasn't destined to, to sit in an office, um, and uh, so in 1984, um, I was keen to join the family business, um, but I wanted to negotiate negotiate my own um, basis. And this is where my family business was dressed well. And although I got involved there, I wanted to start my own identity. And I opened up the Street Life, which started off as a small store doing sort of men's casual wear. And what happened then? Like it didn't stay like that for very long, did it? Well, basically, um, the, the, the dress well was fairly substantial. At one stage, we were sitting with 18 stores in, in Northern Ireland, and they were predominantly in, in shopping centres, so shopping centres and, and which required you know, high-volume sales and uh, a, lot of, a lot of trading hours and, and, with, and a lot of people involved. So uh, we had a great team behind us there, and I started building then the Street Life uh, stores alongside the dress well. Sort of gradually nudging my way to take over, and then and then. So how did that work? Was it just you? Did you build a team of managers around you? How did that work then? Like to grow at such a big level? Yeah, well, just you went searching for people. The, you know, the whole business of retail is is all about people, and really was getting getting good people surrounding me and uh, working that team together. And and very much like I I very much work on the on the ground and and work along with people so you could spot the natural talent. And then so what what happened? So that was like what what year are we at now and how many shops? Oh, Japers, we were going through the uh, year two thousand uh, two thousand and five uh, was booming. Uh, shopping centres were busy. Casual wear was busy. Uh, we were doing men's and ladies branded uh, clothing. Uh, a lot of the brands were very, very strong. Um, the internet was not here. Um, shopping centres were still affordable. Then the sort of retail boom and shopping centre and shopping centre rentals uh, went booming. Um, basically, um, it was decided by a plan issue that you couldn't build any more shopping centres. So basically, anybody who had a shopping centre thought it was it was a valuable commodity, and they and shopping centres started started. Uh, being sold, uh, like I remember a local shop, shopping centre being sold for 14 million. Uh, within a few years, that shopping centre was sold for 100 million. So the rent had to be clawed back from from that sale because it was all it was nearly all borrowed money. And the vast thing about Northern Ireland was the the the, the shopping centres were all owned by local individuals. They were owned by one guys. They were not owned by large pension companies. Um, but and it was all money um, lent by the banks. So that became a problem in 2007, whenever we had our, our major banking recession and the, and the banks were coming on heavy onto the, to the, to the landlords who had borrowed the money. And then they were coming on heavy to the tenants who they were looking to, to extract as much rent as possible. And we were experiencing a downturn in the economy. Uh, retail was, was getting, was one of the first hit retail and housing in 2007. And, uh, we 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 could feel it in the pocket badly, you know. So so we had to make decisions. We fought hard and and we made changes. We survived 2008, 2009, 2010. We were going strong. We thought this recession has to end. We'll be good. We'll come out of this well. But 2011, it just couldn't. We just couldn't survive it. So we we made the decision, and and unfortunately, we, we, it was our decision to make. We decided to close all the stores. Overnight, um, and very much it was on the basis that that we could not we could not negotiate with these landlords, um, um, and and there was no no way forward. So uh, we brought all our stock back to our site in Yutnarge, which which is where we had our warehouse, and basically start again. And how many shops did you have at, when you decided to close them overnight? How many how many shops did you close overnight? Twelve. Oh my god! Twelve stores. 142 people unemployed overnight. Oh yeah. God. Yeah. So, but um, I tried to be true to ourselves. I personally phoned every landlord. I personally phoned every supplier. I spoke to every manager and assistant manager. I tried to communicate with as many of our staff as possible. They all knew what was happening. 
Um, because again, you know, they, they were part of the team. It was a big team that we had. So, so when we come back to Newton Arts, um, basically my tail between my legs and thought, I what? to stop because I closed one and I was traumatized. So how did, how were you at that time? Um, it was tough times, very tough times. Um, the big black dog to talk about it, the recession, you know, or the sort of depression that kicks in, um, was very difficult, very, very difficult. And um, it was only through good friends that personally would phone me and told me, Derek, what are you going to do? You have to get, keep going. And <clears throat> I'm just thinking that one person that we know. I know, I who's, know. Who phoned me the, the day we closed. And said, Derek, you have to go again. You have to go again. You can't give up. And that gives you strength. It's real good inner strength that you get. It does. And yeah. um, I'll just, uh, I suppose this is a time, this is meant to be, but and just to give Derek a chance, um, he'll have to save me in a minute. But um, through your journey in retail, you meet people. And you meet people that are your people and you meet people sometimes that aren't and that's okay. But sometimes you meet special people that you never, ever, ever think you're going to meet that's going to be a friend for life. And Derek and I have a mutual friend and, um, uh, you know, I don't know when this podcast airs, what, where things will be, but he's not well and we love him very much. And this, pod, this podcast is going to be in memory to him and tribute to him Um because of everything that he did for Derek and I both in retail, but as friends as well. And he's someone we care about very much together. And we had a chat before we came on air and both of us um, said our thing and, and were upset and then laughed and all the things that Sean made us do. Um, so um, that, that person he's talking about is Sean that helped him through that hard time. And many years ago was that then that he was there doing that for you? That was uh, 2011, so basically he was a, a sales rep that, that sold me a lot of merchandise, but he would he came to the store and said, look, can I help you sell some of your mannequins to the trade just to try to get a bit of cash in to maybe get going again? And um, he came with some merchandise and said, look, you know, this will help you get started. You know, he was a very, very big part of it. And uh, we're definitely thinking about him today. Absolutely. And... Yeah, uh, it's it's not always about money and business, and it never was with him, and never should be. It should always be about yeah, yeah, your heart and goodness. Um, yeah, I, yeah. I, I always I always sort of think the worst quote, um, or the worst sort of quote they say in business is, "There's no friends in business." Um, that's that's probably the worst thing to ever say. Um, so many of my friends are in business. So many connections, um, with people, um, and and nearly like. It's just your friendship is all built from who you meet, and you're lucky to meet it. In retail, you really meet it, and uh, and even more so now. Now I'm back in Newton Arge Town Centre. I'm I'm back with local connections, and and my friendship and connections have grown um, because I am more local now. I'm not running about the countryside looking after shops, whatever. Um, and and that's helped me engage uh, with the local community. Um, and that's very much uh, that has been a cha- big change in in me um, since since my failure um, is is coming and 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 connecting with with the, with not just business owners, um, community groups, uh, local politicians. Um, basically, I I want to connect with anybody to help me build my business and to build other businesses in in your large town centre. That's. That's the crust of what we need to talk about now because that is what's so important moving forward. So now you're back, to bring it back a wee bit, we're, you're back in Newton Arts with your warehouse and your one store. Is that right? I'm back. Yes, I'm back. So I'm back um, and I have a lot of merchandise to clear. Um, I have a lot of old unsold stock. Um, so I'm now doing a clearance sale. I've now then got my shop and I'm thinking, right, the start buying new stock and turn the shop. So I'm getting the shop going and bringing new stock into the shop. So I relaunching myself because basically I have all these guys who uh, I used to kit out and they're, and they're on the phone as well. The first couple of days sent out, where, where are we going to get our clothes? You know, you, you just, we just come into you and you just, just kit us out. Um, so basically we got the shop going and then I had this large warehouse and then, but also with this large warehouse, I had a rates liability which was costing me, cost me money 
because even when the clearance sale, there wasn't enough to generate to cover the cost. Uh, I was fortunate that I owned the building and, and owned the neighbouring properties, but it was it was it was a it was a it was a, it was a problem. Um, what am I going to do with this? So basically, I brought in a lot of the, the sort of big company estate agents, um, the Belfast estate agents, and they just said, "Well, we're in a, we're in a recession here. Uh, just put a charity shop into it, and that'll kill kill the rates." And I said, "But this is this is the only thing I own now. I need to generate income, and I need to generate this income." For not only me, but I have family. I have I have my brother. I have uh, my mum and dad are still living. We all need to ge- generate some sort of income from this. This was our business, so it was very much the case. What can I do with this? And um, a charity shop, or 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 bring a church in, and, and they'll take it, and that'll kill the rates for you. I needed to generate an income, so uh, I thought long and hard. Um, went around the local estate agents and asked them what the need was, and they said, well, nobody wants big spaces. So, um, but there's other, there's always hairdressers looking for good property. And a lot of the property in, in the small towns are old properties with leaking roofs. And they don't want to take over properties that, that's, that ha- they have to spend a lot of money on. So I thought to myself, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make small units. So basically I started carving this space up into small affordable units um, and then that's where sort of I started going looking for startups and I thought well if I could get this uh, and, and it's very much the 142 people that that I made redundant I want to create 142 jobs I want to pay this back I can't pay it back to the people I made redundant but I want to create employment for that same number so basically my drive was then to, to get startup businesses, look for the owner driver, look for the one girl who's been the local beautician and she wants to go out on her own, the local hairdresser. Um, and, and I sort of bought into people. Um, and, and very much so when the initial people came along, I spoke to them and I bought that person. I bought into their story. I listened to, what, to their passion and looked to see if there was passion. And it wasn't about making money, it was about being successful. And looked for that drive, and and basically we started. We got a beautician came along, and and she started on her own. Within two years, she had six employees working in there. So there's my seven people. We had a hairdresser here, uh, Lindsay from Hair and Co. She, which you have met before. She's she's very good on socials, and uh, she got involved, and now she's sitting with about eighteen staff. So now I've got my twenty five. So then now we 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 got uh, uh, a local cafe opened up. And all of a sudden now she was one person. She her son came along and worked for her. All of a sudden now there's eight people. So my team is building. My numbers are building. So then we have another hairdresser, um, and she started from for herself, and and then her friend joined her within a few weeks. And all of a sudden now there's nine hairdressers working. Albeit a lot of them are part time because they have young families, or whatever. But it works. It's gained employment. It's gained income for that for their household. Uh, so then we go along and we have a guy who I met, um, Paul Flynn. Uh, I met at the local running club. I used to be involved in a local Bally Drain Harriers, and uh, I met him. And he was very he he was very passionate about physiotherapy, and, and he, he was well qualified, and he was working in the NHS. He was a bit disgruntled, wanted to start his own own place. And I basically said, come, I'll, I'll sort it for you. And basically I kitted out his offices for him. And I said, you, when you get going, you can pay me back. And uh, we kitted out his office for him. And within 12 months, he paid me back. He was still working in the NHS and he was working at night time. Um, he's, he's, he tells me, he was talking, talking to him last night. And he's just signed for new premises in Brasheen. And he's going to have two uh, now physio clinics, uh, one based in, in Newtonards, his original, and, and now Brashean, and he's now full time. And, and if anybody suffers back pains, he's the man to come to because he gets you sorted out and all the we'll issues. Tag him. We'll tag him in this podcast. And yes. it's this this community you're starting to gather, and I know you're not finished yet, um, is, it's, it's called the precinct, this area. What does that mean? What does the precinct mean to you? What is that? 
the precinct is basically um, my dad and I were watching watching TV going back in 19, 1980s and there was a assault on, on precinct 13 or something I think it was it was a film that we watched and I always thought I liked the name of it so then I called this the, the precinct I thought it was just something different um, rather than calling it a shopping centre because it's not a shopping centre well, and it's very exactly. much the basis where I've tried to look for I've tried to look for softer retailers so, so softer businesses that, co- that complement each other so very much appointment appoint, appointment based businesses initially because that would drive then the footfall uh, one of the most successful ones we have here is the, the dance school Arge Dance School we have 140 kids come here every Saturday and they come all over through the through the week as well, some nights. But on a Saturday, we have 140 kids. But with 140 kids, we've got 140 grannies or 140 mums. There's that mums. 140 number. There's that, one, huh? there's that 140 number that you've been totally yes, for. yeah, totally. So that it's all just driving that. But but uh, the mix we have a good mix. Um, I didn't look for the normal sort of fashion retail offer or whatever. I, I wanted to make it more appointment based. Um, and it keeps the keeps it um, very much women f- focused because it's the women that drive the economy uh, in my eyes. So sure. and yeah. then also then street life is there, right? So street life, we have the street life shop as such, which 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 predominantly was casual wear. And I'm going to take us back to this man Sean again, our friend Sean. But Sean said to me about five years ago, Derek, you need to get back into suits. You need to get back into suits. Southern Ireland, everybody's buying suits. Suits are the whole Conor McGregor look with the check suits, the picky blinders with the check suits, the guys going to the weddings, guys going to the racehorses. He says, you need to get back into suits. So I said, right, okay. So I started looking at suits and uh, then all of a sudden we started doing suits. That exploded. Uh, just before COVID, um, we were really, uh, we started building very strongly. And then, during COVID, we thought, well, what are we going to do here? We've got, we've got, nearly, we've outgrown our shop, so we need, we need another space during the social distancing. Um, and so we created this, what we call our suit locker, which I'm sitting in today. Which so like basically, yes. So, so this is this is in a. Uh, I got uh, two uh, containers, the con- shipping containers. And I carved up, cut up the shipping containers, and created our, our open space here. So we're in two con- two converted shipping containers, bolted together to make it bigger, to make it wider. And uh, we have it filled with we have fifty suits here, um, all kitted out, all three piece suits. And basically, we're targeting the the wedding market, uh, where we're selling a lot of suits to wedding to wedding grooms. Uh, we're selling selling the suits, of course, to the, the guys going to the weddings. Um, we have. Uh, the horse racing has has kicked off again, and we're doing the whole horse racing piggy blinder look. Um, and our target our target customer is very is very wide. We we do the kids suits from age one to fifteen to match to match the dads or match the granddads. Um, and and very much I think our oldest customer was was eighty eight years of age. He um he was he was the grandfather of of a wedding party and he came in. And it was the first time ever I'd, I had uh, tailored some tailor, tailored somebody's suit, and uh, he'd come back two days later and said, um, "He says uh, one leg is shorter than the other." And I said, "Why? That doesn't happen." We, you know, so I put, put the trousers out, and uh, I said, "They're measuring exactly right." And he says, "No, no." He says, "I have one leg shorter <laughs> than the other." He says, "I was in World War Two, and I was a parachuter, and when I came off, I jumped out of a plane, I broke my leg when I landed." But he hadn't told us that whenever he was uh, in in for his first tailoring. But that's the fun and joy of of dealing with dealing with people. And and so for anyone listening on audio and isn't watching this on YouTube, uh, Derek sitting with the most finest array of suits behind him in what is his suit locker. So that's that's the thing I want to talk to you about. How important is that customer experience now, Derek? Like I know things have changed so much, and you have the precinct there, and there's a lot of footfall, but. It has to be about the experience that they get when they come there or they come to the suit locker. So what are you guys are doing now that is different or embracing that side of things for customers? Well, in 2011, I, I started off when I, when, I, when I restarted the business, basically, um, it was two, two, two uh, girls who, who worked for, with me on, on the street life side and, and they, they, we got us going. So then the two became three. 
Um, and we were sitting with the, the three, three staff and myself um, for a number of years. Um, in this last 12 months, the three has gone to 10. Um, so there's 10 of us now here. And, um, and it's very much driving that customer experience. And, and for us at the Soot Locker, it is very much an, an experience. When the customer comes through the door, we want to size you by, by, by our eyes. We, we will tell you what size you need. We don't use a, a measuring tape. Um, basically, all our staff are trained that basically they, they will judge the customer. And uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of fun as well. Um, but it just sort of shows the, the, the experience that the staff have. And, uh, and, and very much we sort of drive that customer experience. And I drive it from the staff is that they, they have the product knowledge. Um, they know all about the, the different cloths. They know all the different fits. Um, because this is this what has to be different in retail. The customer has to come in and get something what they don't get. They can't get online. Yes. They come in and the person is interested in what their event is. They're interested in making them making them look good. Because if they make them look good, they make them feel good. And it's very much you know. I remember hearing a dentist a dentist saying you know he said I make you smile. You know, we, we want to make you feel good um, and the whole feeling good is, 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 is closed, you know, and, and we want the interactions whenever you go to an event that you're standing out, that you're not standing out being overdressed, but you're comfortable um, in, in what you're wearing and people have noticed and will notice the small detail that, that we, we try to put into our clothing. Our, our suits, we always try to get uh, three-piece suits we will put where, where it's acceptable. We'll put watch chains on it. We'll put uh, small badges on, on our lapels. Um, and that's part of our sort of branding that we do. We have a stag's head branding that we put onto our, our suits. Um, and right down to the, the tie is very much specific to, to match you, to match your, your partner um, and, and the color and, and dressing it through. So it's not the case that we have a hundred of the same ties or or, or a dozen of the same ties, every tie is unique. So basically, if we had three people going to a wedding uh, and they're all coming from street life, they'll all look different. So they'll all be styled individually. So there you have it, as in that's what's different. That, and it's absolutely not to take away from online retailers or anything like that, but there is a difference with that face-to-face -face passion, customer service, like the, that will never die. And to those people that are saying that, you know, the high street is dead and that the bricks and mortar is dead. Like, I'm sure you're like me. Does that not enrage you? Totally enrages me. The high street can be now stronger than ever been. Like the one thing about Newton Ards is, and Newton Ards stands out a way ahead um, of a lot of town centres, is that, it, that it's kept its core independence. Um, in 2019, when I took over the, the presidency of the Chamber of Trade, the one thing I said, Newton Arch is good enough to win awards. And we initially entered the Great British High Street Award and we won in, in 2019 the heat of a Northern Ireland. Now, because of COVID, we're unbeaten, so we're still the High Street of the Year. Yeah. Um, and, and the one thing that we sort of say, and we sort of talk to, to estate agents that will come to Newton Arch and they'll say, you know, um, what do you need? What do you need in Newton Arch? Well, we don't need a Greg's because we've got we've got our own Greg's and we've got better than Greg's. We've got need. We've got Shaw's. We've got Knott's Bakery that can beat you know independent strong businesses that that are doing unique I think products. And um, we don't need Starbucks because we've got Haptic in Newton Arch. We've got Del Piero's. Del Piero's. These small businesses that start off as one, like Del Piero's has started off in Newton Arch and is now, is now up to 12 stores. Haptic has started in Newton Arch, it's now up to two stores. Knott's started in Newton Arch, small bakery, now up to, like, I think it's for five stores, just been bought over by another family business, uh, Corey's, uh, which is a local butchers and, and, and food, food people. Uh, they're going to expa expand that. So we're looking for small businesses, that one person, that has passion, that drives the business and makes the business bigger. You know, like we don't need a top shop. We don't need a Zara. We've got our Coco. We've got John Zara. We've got loads of independence. When you go in, that girl will style you for you. You know, 
it's not just sending out the same look at one press copy of, of this gorgeous, attractive female. That is nothing like the real right? <laughs> you know, Yeah, no, but no, but and like the same like the local traceability. We want, we want, we 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 are very very fortunate in Yonard that, and this was very much uh, uh, during COVID when COVID was a shutdown and all the towns were shut down. Newton Arch still held strong because we had our butchers. We had our local butchers that have all their meat, traceable meat, normally from their own herds that they have because they're all farmer backgrounds, or Corey's meats, or Mawinnie's. Mawinnie's butchers has been in Newton Arch for I don't know how many years. I think maybe it must be 50 years. Um, we have our Albert Bowles. We have, you know, H&J Carnduffs. Again, another business that's grown from one store and, and is now in, in about nine locations. Um, so we're, we're always looking to, to start off with that one person. We don't want the multinationals. Newton Arch, during the retail boom, never got the multinationals. The Clarks, the Top Shops, the Burtons never opened. So now, when now they're retracting from the high street and we see towns like Corey and Ballymena ported down, decimated. Large units decimated. We don't. We we're, we're not full. We we have uh, there's opportunities there for people if, if they want to come. But come and start your business in your large and let, watch it grow. So what I'm hearing you say is the story behind all those businesses needs to be told. People need to see that. Like I can hear the passion there, and obviously all the businesses that are there have passion. And, and the people in Newton Arts and further field are supporting you guys because you are what you are. If there's other retailers listening and town centres that perhaps have lost that sparkle, that magic that was what they were once all about, have you any advice about how to get that going again? Because I know in Dungannon, the retailers that are there are top notch. Like the ones that are still there are unbelievable and people travel from all over. But I'm just saying Dungannon because that's my local town. But I mean, how can town centres, I know we don't have an executive in place and there isn't fun being released, but look what you're doing by just championing people. So how do retailers do this, Derek? Work with your community. Yeah. Look after your community, and the community will look after you. Very much driven. Like in 2019, we had a Christmas Christmas market. We wanted to have a Christmas market in the square, and we and we closed the high street and put the we we put the Christmas market on the street. But the square, our main Conway Square, which is a great space that we have, we give it over to the community. And the community, we had the local dance groups dancing. We had the local football teams. Doing, doing displays, we had the local bands, we had the local schools. It's keep it all local. Get everybody involved and everybody's part of it. And that's what drives the people. Because if we Tommy comes to, to, to try to, to score goals on a net, he's going to have all his aunts coming and his granny's going to come and, and all that. And when they're there, then they're going to buy a cup of tea. And then they'll buy a cup of tea and they'll buy a bun. They'll buy a bun and the next thing they'll buy a dress. And it's all just about engaging with the whole local community. And that's very much... We, as a chamber, we, we take a different. We try to not take a such a business approach that some of the chambers do. We try to go take a step back. We talk to the, our community groups. We engage with them. We talk to our, our local councillors. We make them accountable. We get them working. We give them yellow vests to come and work. Don't just come and talk about it. Come and work. Come and be a part of it. So, and that's very much as, as, as still from my background is you get on it. You get the job done, and and. No job is, is too big for any of us. Oh my God. Like, this is the way everybody should be looking. Like, this is why Derek is on the podcast because this is what it's all about. We can't, yes, funding might be released and there might be rates relief for such and such a place if there's a business moves in. But at the end of the day, the core values of community, collaboration, wanting people to succeed has to be there. Otherwise, it's going to fail anyway, right? Totally. Totally. Yes. Link, link everybody together, and and we're looking we're looking for link ups with with other with other traders in the town where, where where we can we can highlight you know we can highlight the the local the girl who has the the yoga studio that has the yoga classes you know people people go there you know for for exercise and sometimes because they have a condition but they maybe also need a link with the local bed shop because the problem is the problem is her haven't changed their bed in eight years and that's all part of it. Or so the, physio, the physio that's in the precinct, they might need him when they hurt their back, right? 
exactly, exactly. Yeah, how it all works. You know, here we also have we have a a, a, a no local bridal shop that we work very very closely with. Um, every every bridal show we do it beside them because we help them. we we bring our stuff in our van and help them because they don't have a van, so they're a smaller business. So a, any connections at all we can make with our business. Some people don't get it. Some people are 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 um, dubious about about where we're coming from. Um, I have more connections with the two other menswear retailers in Newton Arts. And I need strong connections with them because we, we have so much in common, but in a lot of towns, they don't want to engage with their own type. Know. You know, we're, we're initially, we're, we're, not, we're now trying to, with the chamber, is trying to get all the coffee shops to sit around one table and actually work together because not everybody wants to drink the same cup of coffee in the same place, in the same day, every day of the week. They want to move about. They want to have different shared experiences. But it also it also helps to drive their business and drive the quality up How and makes them better. How refreshing is that? And um, it's it's taken away the fear. No one's trying to take your business or steal your ideas or anything. Once that common purpose of good for the time is the purpose of everyone, then there's only good can come from that. And I can see that in you. Totally. Tell me, yes. So, are, yeah. is there any more? Like, we need loads of you in all the different times. But you know, Derek, like, if, I think if people listen to this, there might be a realization that things need to change in the mindset of retailers as well. And it's not their fault. Traditionally, it's been done where you stand in your shop and you do your thing, and people will come. But those days are gone, right? Those days are. If you just stay in your shop, you'll, you'll lose it. The 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 one um and 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 in two thousand eighteen I was brought into the chamber and and I, I I was asked to help and do different things um by another retailer and the engagement that I have got um, and how that has helped my business and um, being involved with other people has been refreshing you know I I was never involved in the chamber in the past and I and I do regret that and the and and it's helped it's helped for me um. To build, and it's also good sometimes to do help for others. Um, you, you do get a wee kick from that. I get a personally get a kick from helping others, um, and 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 it does come back to you. You know, um, there was a local guy who just started a business, and um, and we got him, we got him rates relief, um, which saved him a lot of money, uh, just through just through the connections, um, and we all learn off each other. You know, none of us have that actual blueprint for life, um. And it's just so refreshing, so, so refreshing to be involved. No, you are refreshing. Like, you are refreshing. And I, so Derek, here's how Derek and I met. Derek, I don't know how you knew to come to me, but Derek came up to my shop. Didn't you come to my shop? I came to Dungan on one wet, wet Tuesday night, I think it was. Wet, wet Tuesday night when I had my shop and I used to run workshops about how to use social media and digital to reach your audience. And there Derek was, and I was thinking, who is this man? Like, came all the way from Newton Arts and never seen him before in my life and all. And very endearing when you were there. And I could see you were a warm person and open to find out. So then he said to me here, so I chance you come and run that workshop down for all the businesses that I have down in the precinct. And he paid me to come to Newton Arts and deliver a workshop to all of them to showcase what social can do for your business. And even back then, he was championing the people in the precinct, like wanting them to know as much as they could to get the word out there. And I remember being in delivering the workshop and there was a car sales guy I think it was in the precinct uh, he came because you invited loads of people not just the people that were in the precinct and he said to me like I just want to sell cars like this isn't going to sell me cars and you know we had a conversation and we trashed it out and you were there and encouraging everybody and, uh, and when that car salesman went away he might have still thought I was crazy but it opened his idea his mind to the fact that there are ways to get out there and get your word out there so you've been all, always been doing that since I've known you and I think this conversation we've had today I might be a big realization for people and um, so the high street heroes is launching this week you're going out a photo shoot for it what does that mean what should businesses be doing now Derek, to get noticed so basically basically the newton arts slant for, for that is basically hopefully at half 12 there's a photo shoot on the square and hopefully that's going to be the local workers in, in the town it's not just a case about rolling out the 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 bosses and of all of all the businesses it's newton arts is very much driven by by the workers um and and the local heroes we're, we're hoping that, that again we won that award back in 2019 um for high street of the year for newton arts street life got got a silver medal for it and our local butchers and greengrocers won awards so yeah we're keen to get get involved with that and it's good to champion it's good it's good to sometimes pat people on the back and say well done well you know 
and and uh, so many so many things came has come good out of COVID that we can see. People are wanting to engage more. Um, businesses uh, during COVID changed quickly and and started uh, an online and delivery service, and they're still doing a delivery service. You know, our local butchers and bakers and are all all delivering pr- produce now, uh, which is great, and has expanded the business. Um, yeah, so. Uh, and also on the, the back of that, we have the Voice for Locals, uh, which is another connection where it's a local app. Um, and Newton Arts, again, has been involved with that. And that's been rolled out through the towns of, of Northern Ireland. And this is a, an app that has got that uh, has got funding from the British government of 1.8 million. And we met with Jay yesterday to launch it in Newton Arts. And uh, this app connects your website, your social media channels, um, and to give and improve much more with your customer reactions, you know, uh, and and it's and it's and it's great to get customer reactions when we don't always get it. You know, the one the one good thing about the, the wedding side of the business here we have is we get all these lovely photographs of of the the grooms, the bride and grooms, with a thank you card now, which which is which is a great treat for the staff, um, because. In normal menswear retail, you don't really get the feedback. The guys don't send you a photograph of what they're out on Saturday night, you know. But that's that. It's always good to get that, and it's really encouraging. In relation to that number one forty that you said at the start, one forty two. One forty two. That's exactly that's what I mean. One forty two. You uh, seem like you have this this thing in your head where you want to reach that figure and more and by the signs of it even when you said about the 140 kids and the dance like that's that's people you've engaged and brought into your community like you've I would say you've surpassed it a lot more but I know you have that figure in your head are you there yet in your mind about making peace with that which wasn't your fault uh, where are you at with that um it's still raw it's still raw the the, the, the failure part in 2011 is still raw um, because we had a good, strong business, and, and the business model changed on us. Um, but but what we've done here, what we've done here in the precinct, the development here, where we have we have now twenty businesses. Uh, we have we have brewing yaki that that does these fabulous bubble teas. You have to come down for those someday. Oh my god, I, I've seen bubble teas. I seen the only place I've ever seen bubble teas is London. I've never seen them here. Yeah, well, this is fabulous. This this girl, this girl started started during lockdown. Came to me, hadn't a, she came up with this idea and said she wanted to do bubble teas and these Japanese desserts, um, which are like these uh, desserts with, with with like Nutella inside it and unusual, really really unusual. Uh, started during COVID, um, she didn't want to sign a lease, and says, you know, I said, well, just come and start, just come and start, and just pay me weekly, and we'll see how it goes, and just just because you can see the passion, I could see the passion going. And she's now she's got the brewing yaki. She op- only opens uh, only opens, but Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And she opens at one o'clock. And at one o'clock, there's a queue. What a dream! At one o'clock, one o'clock to five o'clock, there's a queue every day. Uh, she's now opened. She's now that's so she opened in two thousand and twenty. Uh, she's now opened in Bangor, and she's now about to open uh, in Belfast. So there, all of a sudden, is a girl who came with with, with an idea, and uh, we just gave her space to work it, and, and she's flourished. We've just got Heidi's Bakehouse, a girl who was who was baking cakes, bakes fabulous cakes at home, and is now we've got her set up here in what they call we shack, um, and she's she's open now at the weekends and and doing a home delivery service, and uh, you, you can order wedding cakes, birthday cakes, and are just come for treats. They're unbelievable, but not good for the waistline. No, absolutely not. But still, like you're, if there's people listening, you know, this is what champion business is. This is what believing in business is, and this is the reality that businesses are thriving and succeeding and opening up. And yes, there's ones that aren't, but there absolutely are the new ones coming through. But it takes people like Derek, and you know, so I don't know if you know. I'm sure your people tell you all the time, but I am in awe of you and what you do, and I think that you're incredible. And I wish. That so with someone like you in every time, and I hope when people listen that there will be the because there is the fire starters in every time, but perhaps they don't believe they can make but, a difference, but one person can. Well, no, no, no. Other people make the change. I go searching. I, I, I am not an original thinker. 
I, I go search and see what's worked well elsewhere. And I, and, I, and I search the continent. I search what's going on in America. I look for trends. It's, it's what I've always done for fashion, basically. Because fashion, the one thing, the one good thing about the fashion business is it's change. Your best seller today is your problem tomorrow. Mm-hmm. It's, what you sco- it's what's going on in your sale wheel because it's left of the bad size. And so you're always looking for change. So I'm always trying to um, search through social media, through the newspapers, through TV, what's happening elsewhere, what's working elsewhere. And uh, the, a, no, a local initiative in, in another neighbour in town, uh, which is what, what we're jump, jumping on next, is they have they've started a pop-up shop. So in Cumber, they're doing a pop-up shop. So you can re- take a shop and rent it for a week. So we're about to do this in Newton Arge. We're about to launch this next week. So basically we're looking for somebody who's like, I've got a business idea. I've got a product to make at home. I need somewhere to sell it, but I don't want to take a big jump. So we're sort of saying, right, come to Newton Arge. We'll give you a market stall on a Saturday. You come here. We'll give you the market stall. We'll give you the gazebo. You come, set up your st- stall. You have that on the Saturday. And on the Saturday, you can sell your stuff to our local our local market. We have a fabulous market here on, on every Saturday. And, and you know, ours has been going for 50-odd years. The same guy, Clive, runs it. And he's shouting on the right front. Anybody knows you know, knows Clive. So we have the market stall. You're going to come and set up your stall there. Then you're going to move your stock on a Saturday night, and you're going to move it into a shop, which I have here at the precinct. And you're going to run a shop for a week. So that will give you the experience of having a market stall to having a proper retail unit and you run it for the week so we're, that's our next initiative wow. and uh, we we haven't launched it yet we've done it quietly to a few people and we have a serious uh, excitement about that and oh, the potential wow. of the potential of that of giving somebody a platform um to build on Unreal. It's all about opportunity and it's all about connections, as you say, and, you know, getting involved in other things. You hear about these opportunities too. So I hope this, I would say when the podcast goes live, that will already be up and running that um, in yes. the, uh, market and that pop-up shop. So we'll be interested to see how that's panning out. Um, thank you so much. Like, like I didn't, I thought I said, Derek, we'll only be 20 minutes. We'll only be trying, but like we're talking, we're going to talk and talk and talk. But I no doubt we'll have you on the podcast again to find out how all that's going and what's happening again in Newton Arts and, and how that has grown. But I just want to say now as we leave, um, uh, we will always have that mutual friend that we talked about in common and now you and I are friends as well and and I, I, I admire you and respect you greatly especially for your honesty because sometimes people need to hear how challenging it's been but look at the rewards now so go to your High Street Heroes um, a, a photo shoot and I wish you all the best with it and thank you so much for being on the Dig Podcast Eric yeah but thank you thank you also for, for all the training you've done for us uh, and um, it's, it's great to see to see your business opportunity has has grown so much from from visiting that store on on that cold wet uh, windy. Well, look how much has changed. When I visited you, I had a store, and now I don't, and I felt like a failure, like you did, and made people redundant as well. All the store in a much lesser scale, but I would say equally, my heart was breaking as much as yours. But yes. like you, I was always building community and connections and was able to thankfully, as you talk about, rise up from the ashes or yeah. whatever. And, and I love what I do now and I love that it gets to meet people like you, bring them on the podcast and show people the way it should be done. So thank you to both of us. Is that what we're saying? Thank you to both That's of us. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay. Yes. Well All right. Thank love you. to speak to you. You thank too, you, Derek. Good man. As always, thank you so much for joining me on the Dig Podcast. It's my absolute privilege to speak to thousands of you each week. If you want to connect and become part of the Dig community, then follow Dig for Success on social media or sign up to our email list on digforsuccess.com. Until next week, just remember, this is your time to drive your business forward.